Hey guys, it's the Villaman here and this is going to be a pretty interesting video because in this video I'll be taking my home theater to the next level and I'll be starting with these but there's going to be so much more to it so stick around. So these speakers are the Arundel Sound flagship 1723 surround speakers and I'll be adding them to the current 1723S speakers that I have. Ooh. These are heavy. All right, so let's see how big they are in person because it looks pretty big so far in the bag. Look at that, it's huge. Just, <laughs> just look at the size difference. Yeah, it's gonna be epic. It, it is gonna be epic. So these are the Arendel Sound 1723 and the 1723S, the smaller version. Now this one, like my main towers, has a eight inch woofer and the tweeter while the smaller S version has a six and a half inch woofer with the tweeter. And if you haven't seen my review on those speakers, you should definitely check it out because they are some phenomenal speakers and I actually ended up buying them after, after I reviewed them. So yeah, you should definitely check it out if you're unfamiliar with them. But for those who know, they know. And like the S version, they are a triaxial design. So not only does the sound come from the front facing drivers, but also the smaller ones on the side, which will be great for surround duty because of the placement. So it gives you a bunch of flexibility uh, as far as placement options go. So it's really great. And I'm looking forward to hearing how they all sound together. The plan is to add these additional two surround speakers to my bed layer to make it seven channels. So it'll be a 7.2.4 system. Now I know some of you are wondering if I'm going to be adding two more channels to my existing Denon X4300 H receiver. And no, I will not. Instead, actually, I'll be integrating a processor into my system, a 16 channel processor. So I won't be using all the channels available, but hey, that's the come. Let's install these speakers first. Come on. Now, thankfully, the speakers come with mounting hardware in the box since they're wall mountable. So that's one thing you will not have to worry about. I assume this part goes on the speaker itself while this one will be on the wall. So these bigger flat screws attach the mount to the speaker while these smaller screws attach the mounts together. So how they fit is like this. And the screws go in here to secure them so they don't move. Pretty cool. So this is the layout of my current surround speakers where both speakers are in the corners of the room angled slightly towards the listening position. And for the new layout, we'll have two speakers on the back walls and the other two on the side walls beside it. But first we have to do a few measurements to make sure that the placements and the resulting angles are adequate so that it can create a good surround experience. And in doing so, I'll find the spot to place the speaker mount. And I'll do this again three more times for the remaining speakers. Ignore my comically long pencil. Long, long Not only do I have to make sure that the mount's in the correct location, but also that it's level because no one wants a crooked speaker, right? And after that, we start the drilling. Because of the way these walls are constructed, I don't necessarily have to use wall anchors uh, for the screws, so I won't use them for these mounts. Once that is installed, now we can begin wiring the speakers so that we can mount it. And while doing this, we also disconnect the bridge because the bridge actually enables the side firing drivers on the speaker. And for the side surrounds, we don't need to have the side firing drivers enabled because the front facing drivers will be aimed directly at the listening position. Thank you. 
and this is just my look. So I've had my existing surround speakers for over a year now and it just so happens that I have absolutely no idea where the actual mounting brackets are. So I guess it's a screw to the rescue. And it's a good thing that these things have screw holes on the back where I can uh, mount them to the wall. Clutch, clutch. Next we'll talk about the upgraded brains of the operation, which is the processor that will replace my Denon X4300H receiver, which I've had for five years. Now the Maestro X7 is a 16 channel processor with all the bells and whistles. Of course it supports Dolby Atmos and DTSX as well as Oro 3D and it also has Direct Live for speaker calibration. Additionally it supports AirPlay 2 for streaming audio from a phone and grouping rooms while doing so and has balanced XLR outputs for all 16 channels. The HDMI ports on this processor are currently limited to version 2.0 though, which could potentially be upgraded in the future. Now since this is an AV preamp processor, it does not have built-in amplification, so to power my speakers I will need an external amplifier, and the amplifier driving my primary speakers will be the Parasound A51 power amplifier. Now this is a great amplifier which will have no problems powering my Arendel Sound 1723 towers with their quad 8 inch woofers or any other speaker I'll be reviewing in the future for that matter. It's a 5 channel amplifier which is THX Ultra 2 certified and puts out 400 watts into 4 ohms all 5 channels driven. That only accounts for 5 of the 11 speakers in my setup though. For the remaining speakers, I'll be turning to the Aula Audio Model 7000X amplifier. Like the Parasound, this amplifier also has XLR inputs but has 7 channels which it can power at 200 watts into 4 ohms, all channels driven. I've had the Model 5000 for a few years and I absolutely loved how it performed so I had no problems getting the 7000X when I needed it. I'm connecting the processor to the amp using these XLR cables which aren't overly fancy but they're color coded and shielded which is the most important thing. So I have the amp connected to my network using a wired ethernet port which is connected to this wireless access point right here and then you see all the XLR cables for all the channels that are powered by the external amps. Uh, these are my inputs from the Apple TV to my Blu-ray player to the switch and my consoles and then this is the output to the projector and this right here is actually the USB stick that was included in the packaging for updates. And all the XLR cables are labeled because that makes them a lot easier to identify and then attach to the lacing bar. All right, so here we are on the flip side of the installation of both 
the speakers and the equipment driving them. And although I did it all in this one video, in reality, it took a few months for all the equipment to actually get here because of the various lead times. But now we have the entire system put together and is a cohesive whole. So what's my first impression of the actual setup, the software setup necessary and listening? Well, as far as direct live is concerned, which is a big part of our processor like this, because this particular processor has the license for Dirac included, which is not the case with, say, the Monoprice uh, processor, which is another great option. But in this case, Dirac was pretty easy to use once I read the instructions and understood it. So I was able to uh, measure my room using uh, multiple points and I use the Umic One mic versus the included mic in the package for the Maestro X7 because that mic isn't quite as good as the one for Mini DSP. So I use that, which I've also used that mic to measure speakers when I review them. But anyways, I use that to measure my room so I could do the calibration. There were uh, a lot of points, I think 13 or so points that I had to measure individually. But then after that, I had a good understanding of the speaker responses in the room and I could implement my house curve, which I actually did. And I, the way I did mine is I had a 10 dB boost in the bass after uh, 80 hertz, so when the speakers crossed over, but the way Dirac works is that it started implementing that boost at the speaker level before it crossed over to the subwoofer. So all my speakers have somewhat of a boost at say 90 to the, uh, to the crossover, which is 80 hertz for all my speakers. Actually, I think it's more like 100 hertz that the boost begins, but that's a minor detail. Now this Maestro X7, as well as the JBL SDP55 and the Arkham AV40 are all based on the same platform, which was developed by Harman Audio basically, but they have minor differences like some technical implementation and the DACs that are included in them. But besides that, they're essentially the same unit in different clothes and, and they all have their own unique features which would make one more appealing to you than the other. For example, the JBL has Dante, a Dante implementation, so that's audio over ethernet and it also has some better DACs than this Maestro X7. But if Dante isn't that important to you, then they're basically identical. So either one of these would have worked for me and I ended up getting the Maestro X7. Now this Maestro X7 has a bigger brother, the Maestro X9, which has a better technical implementation as well as better DACs. And that's more suited for you if you say are a real audiophile and you want the best of the best audio quality. So that would be a great option but the x7 gets you most of the way there but isn't uh, almost twice as expensive which at that point I'd rather get something like say a Trinov which would you know have more flexibility as far as uh, calibration and speaker placement is concerned but that's another story. This X7 does all I need to do, especially in this room. And I'm not using anywhere near the full capabilities of it, so it has a lot of room to grow with me as my setup changes in the future as well. All right, but enough about that. I'm sure you're wondering how it actually sounds to go from a 5.2.4 system driven by an AV receiver to a 7.2.4 driven by a pre-pro or separate for that matter. It's funny, during my research, one of the things I kept seeing was about channel separation, but I think it's a bit different from that, my experience at least. So let me frame it this way. So my system before, it sounded like a collection of individual speakers working together to recreate sound. So of course I had, you know, some really good detail as far as objects are concerned, but it always felt like it was just, you know, an object moving from say speaker A to speaker B and to C and so forth. But with the processor, it's completely different. So instead of hearing the object move from say speaker A to speaker B, it sounds like a complete system. So the speakers essentially disappear and it sounds kind of cliche, but that's exactly what happens. The objects 
just appear like they are actually in the room and are moving around and you don't really notice it going from speaker A to speaker B. The speakers disappear and the objects are what remain and all the other sounds that make up the soundtrack of the movie you're watching. It's really, really cool. Audio in movies now sounds so much more detailed and I'm hearing things in movies that I have never heard before. There's just a clarity that this processor brings to the sound in movies now, which is a level above what I had with my Denon receiver. And of course I paid for that because this is substantially more expensive than the Denon receiver, but I really think it was worth it. Some of the scenes that are great tests for this, and I think is a good test for you to find out just how well your system handle uh, objects moving around in your room are the race scene in Ready Player One when they're collecting the coins, uh, Suicide Squad when the starfishes are floating around attacking the people, as well as Gravity when they are panning around the spaceship and the Camertage scene in Doctor Strange. Those are absolutely incredible if you have the right system and that's exactly how i feel experiencing these movies with my system now it's awesome It's not all rainbows and butterflies though. This processor has some software glitches that can get pretty annoying sometimes. For example, sometimes you'll be watching a movie and the audio just cuts out completely. So then you have to essentially rewind what you're watching. And I think as the Blu-ray player sends the audio back to the processor, then it basically picks up the audio again and then it resumes. But that's really annoying and kind of takes you out of the experience whenever it happens. There are some usability issues that were better on the Denon than they are on the audio control. For example, changing your speaker types and have your calibration be applied to it or not. So for example, if I'm listening to music, uh, if I listen to stereo uh, two-channel music with Dirac Live enabled, it just doesn't sound very dynamic. It sounds kind of clinical and is not at all what I like when listening to music. So I tend to uh, disable direct live and also change my front stage to large versus crossed over at 80 hertz when watching movies. But to do that, I have to log into the web portal and change those settings when on the Denon receiver, I could just go into settings and change the fronts to large and that would be that. The audio control just doesn't have that flexibility. If I calibrated my system with direct live using a small size with an 80 hertz crossover and say I just wanted to have my speaker set to large, then I'd have to disable direct live entirely because direct only works with the speaker settings that it was calibrated with. So if I wanted to use my speakers as large, I would have to disable direct live and then change my speaker settings that way which is fine when I have to do it most times. But the good thing is that it stores the Dirac configuration for your device type. So my Blu-ray will have Dirac Live implemented or enabled, but my Apple TV, which I play most of the music through, will have it off. I'll be covering more of the merits and pitfalls of the processor in my full review. So make sure to stick around and subscribe if you haven't yet, because I have a bit to say about it. Also, the reason why I have different branded amplifiers is because the Parasound will be my reference amp going forward, the Parasound A51, because that could pretty much power any speaker that I throw at it. So I want a powerful amplifier for my speaker reviews going forward, but I also have seven channels that need to be powered. So I couldn't have another amp, which is only five channels, like say the A52. So instead I, opted for a seven channel one because I only have so much space in this 27U rack so I couldn't add say you know two more amps just so I, I would have enough channels to cover all my speakers so the seven channel outlaw audio 
X or 7000X is the perfect choice in this because then that powers the Atmos speakers and my uh, rear surrounds which are the smaller 1723S speakers. But then I have one channel left over but that's no big deal. But yeah, I finally think the audio quality of my system matches the video. In fact, when I think about it, I think it actually exceeds it, at least for now. Since I have all this high performance equipment in the rack now, I added an AC Infinity fan to the top so I can have air circulating through convection and keep all that equipment running cool. It works pretty well, but yeah, I'll be publishing reviews of all this new equipment, so stick around for that. Those are to come. Also, check out the merch store for awesome t-shirts like this or anyone that you've seen me wear in the video. They are great and you should get one. Oh, and thanks to the guys over at Dream Media Home Theater where I got the Maestro X7. They gave me a great deal on it and if you're in the market for this processor or one like it, then definitely give them a call or an email. I'll include their information in the description. Thanks to the guys at Parasound as well for sending over this beast, the Parasound Halo A51 power amplifier. Don't forget to like the video if you liked it and subscribe if you haven't. Thanks for watching and until next time, this has been your friend in Neighborhood Villa Man saying be safe and peace.